Well, hi everyone. My name is Neil Milton and I'm the General Manager of ChildSafe. It is absolutely fantastic to have you with us. A special welcome to those that are watching live right now and those that will watch after uh, this has actually happened. Also a special welcome to those that are watching live on YouTube as well. So every single month we run these uh, Facebook Lives with experts. It's free and it's an opportunity to grow as parents to be the best parents that we can be. I am a parent of three children and I'm also the general manager of ChildSafe. For those who do not know who ChildSafe is, ChildSafe is a not-for-profit harm prevention charity and we work with organisations to prevent harm and abuse of children. And this includes working with parents to help them uh, to be the best parents they can be so their children can be safe and that they can grow up and be able to thrive in, in an incredible um, and unpredictable world. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to comment in the live comments. I want you to comment and tell us what state you're from. Where are you watching this from? What country are you from? And also how many children you actually have. So state or country and also how many children. That will be absolutely fantastic. Now, the reality is that uh, it's alive, right? So I can't see you. You can see me. I can't see you. And it's actually pretty hard at times to engage and make sure that people are engaged in this um, discussion, even though it is a really important topic today. Um, so what we want you to do is uh, we want you to use emojis as a way of uh, connecting in content. So what that means is that if you feel sad when you, when you hear something, we want you to put a sad emoji. If you feel happy, put a happy emoji, etc., etc., etc. If you feel confused, put that one or something like that. Um, there is opportunity to be able to do that. So I want to encourage you to do that as well. Um, the other thing is that uh, we at Child Safe Australia uh, have created a Facebook group specifically for parents called Child Safe Australia dash for parents. And we want to invite you to come along to that and uh, we'll admit you into that group as we share incredible content around how to be the best parent that you can be and also uh, from experts and other industry leaders to help us in this space. Um, the other thing is that uh, we have a website. You just have to go to childsafe.org.au forward slash live. And there's a bunch of other content there that is really, really great for parents, but also um, for information around when the next live is, etc. Now, I want to let you know as well uh, that there is opportunity. We get asked this all the time as people are so generous. We get asked all the time, is there a way that we can give to your organisation to keep you sustainable? We know that COVID has hit you hard as well. Um, is there a way that we can support you? And, um, and so on that page, childsafe.org.au forward slash live, you can actually donate. And, you know, $10 uh, doesn't seem like much, but that can actually make a big difference for us so we can continue to run these lives, which do cost money to do, um, but so we can get the right experts in and um, we can actually do the best we can for you. So I want to invite you to, to donate today. It's end of tax time as well. So if you would like to do that, we would love to have you. Now, we are just about to welcome our special guest. And uh, I just want to take this opportunity to say a wonderful um, thank you so much for taking the time to tune in today. We know that it's... Um, it's been a crazy time in COVID, a really tough time. And uh, if you're in Victoria, you know that there's lockdowns even more. And the reality is that um, it can be tough as parents. I know that I've struggled at times with getting to um, make sure that I'm parenting effective and, and really, really well for my children in this time and giving them the space and time to navigate and to have the, um, the right conversation. Um, we're actually really looking forward to uh, sharing with you today and thanks so much for caring enough to make sure that you are here to talk about this topic. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Melinda tankard Rust, who is an incredible person. Uh, she is an author, a speaker and a massive advocate uh, for young people and I would like to welcome her on the screen right now. 
Hi, Neil. Thanks so much for the opportunity to, to talk to your audience here today. No worries. Thanks so much, Melinda. Thanks for taking the time and giving your time free of charge to be able to allow us to talk about a topic that is incredibly difficult. Now, before we go any further, we need to let people know that um, if people, we want people to like, to share and to tag their friends um, in this and they can go into the draw to win an amazing book. What's that book, Melinda? Well, there's actually two books today, Neil. Oh, uh, I have uh, two resources to help our parents. Uh, one is how to talk to your kids about porn, which is the most easy to read, accessible a book I have found on helping parents to have what is a very difficult conversation, a conversation oh. we would really rather not have. And I'm also throwing in good pictures, bad pictures, which is actually written to help your child. So the, the parent or the caregiver reads this book with their child, very uh, practical strategies, what to do if you see something bad. And um, it keeps the lines of communication open. It, it takes an approach which isn't shame-based. It takes an approach that really confronts reality. Your child will see porn whether you want them to or not. So they're the two uh, books on offer today. Fantastic. So to get that, if you just joined us, make sure you like, you share and you tag this particular live post and um, you can go into the draw to win those incredible books. Um, we want you to encourage you, those that have just joined us, make sure you use emojis to show emotion. So if you're happy, put your happy emoji. If you're not, um, then, uh, you know, maybe it's a sad emoji. But let's just try it right now. Let's give the clapping emoji for Melinda as she comes. Awesome. Let's do it. Fantastic. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So let's kick this off. Um, we have a QA and a straight after. Uh, this and people can start to put their questions in the comments uh, and feed them in and uh, our wonderful people from PN Digital, Rodney and Joe, will be uh, supporting us in the back end and feeding me questions um, after this presentation. So here's the, uh, the major thing that I did want to say first before we kick off these questions. It is 10 years of Collective Shout, which is your organisation that you have that you run, that helps organise or helps shut down, hopefully, and make a big noise to make sure that um, places who are dis displaying pornography uh, don't impact children and maybe even be taken down. Can you tell us just quickly um, what this means to you? 10 years in this space. Well, we just. Uh, so happy to be at this place of ten, 10 years, 10 years of campaigning and activism against uh, sexualization of children, objectification of women, calling out what we call porn culture at every level of society. It, it really started out as an idea. Um, my third book, Getting Real, Challenging the Sexualization of Girls, had just come out. And people were asking, well, what can we do about this? We know what the research says. We know that sexualizing children is harmful to their well-being, their physical health, their, their mental health, their emotional health. Uh, they were looking for a grassroots movement that they could join. And so I thought, why not? Let's start something, collective shout, and <laughs> put some friends together. Uh, it was a crazy idea, but somehow it has been successful and we've seen uh, multiple victories against advertisers, marketers, corporations who uh, engage in these harmful practices to, to sell things. So it's, it's a great uh, stage to reach, our 10th anniversary. We would have been having parties all around the country, however, yeah. we're going to be rolling out a, a virtual celebration uh, in about a month's time. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, you know, um, I just need to tell you this, that um, I know you've been uh, advocating massively and, and trying to shut down uh, Honey Burdette, um, which is a, a lingerie shop in uh, places like Eastland and other shopping centres. And uh, and every time I walk past that shop with my son um, and my daughter, they, they, they say things like, oh, that, that model, you can see her breasts, you know. Um, and um, I'm like, I know, I know, it's terrible, isn't it? And they're like, yeah, why do we have to see that? We don't understand why we have to see that. And I think yeah. for me, as a dad, um, as a parent, I think you are doing such an incredible job because um, 
we live in such a sexualized world. And I, I want to talk to you as we start this first um, first question is, you know, what is the average age of a person who actually sees pornography the first time? Mm -hmm. And why are pornographic sites and advertising aiming at this age? It's deeply disturbing to acknowledge that even very young children are seeing pornified portrayals of women at every level of society. It's the wallpaper of their lives. In terms of what they're seeing online, uh, the average age has come down to about nine or 10 now, and certainly uh, 100% of boys have uh, been exposed to porn by the age of, of 15. But the, the, the age level is definitely uh, becoming lower, and that's why we are forced to have, have this conversation, tragically. Is it, is it actually that because, you know, boys' bodies and women's body and girls' bodies are changing and their mindsets are changing and hormones are racing and all those sort of things, that, that these advertisers and also pornographic, the pornographic industry, um, is it because they know that and so therefore that's why they're targeting it or is there some other sinister reason? Well, certainly... Uh the fact about puberty and development have always been there. What the porn industry has been able to do is harness the internet to be able to reach new markets, to uh, drop porn into the Facebook feeds of young boys, for example, to create entire genres of porn based on children's most popular cartoon characters. So that's an industry that that wants to grow, that wants to expand, that is just that is reaching a, a whole new market and uh, grooming and and socialising uh, boys to be taught by the porn industry about women, about girls, about what women and girls exist for. So this is about expanding a multi-billion-dollar industry and deliberately targeting young people as new consumers uh, to, yeah. to grow the industry. It's, you know, it's very deliberate. Yeah, and it sounds deliberate. And that's what really, you know, breaks my heart. Um, you know, uh, it's, it, I know that, um, that from, a, from a really young age, it really is the developmental side, the developmental side, you know, that young age, um, under that 12 years old is that real developmental side. We know the brain doesn't develop fully for between 22 and 25. Yeah. Um, and so you're imprinting these messages. Correct. A really important question that I have for you, and, and I think everyone is is asking this, is what are the impacts of, of a child seeing pornography and how does it rewire the brain? So as you say, they are being exposed to porn at a critical time in their sexual development. What we are seeing is a never before seen assault on the healthy sexual development of our children. Their sexual templates are still under construction and we have uh, allowed the warping and the distorting of that developing sexual template what all of the research shows is that this is giving children a distorted idea about bodies, relationships and sexuality. You are injuring their brains, hyperactivating the appetite system, hyperactivating uh, what might have been a, a normal sexual, a normal response to, to things. Uh, you're hypercharging that. And so even young boys now are being aroused by depictions of extreme brutality, sadism, violence, rape porn, incest porn, and they think this is normal. They think women want to be abused, women want to be treated violently. A young boy asked in a report last year, uh, do I have to strangle my girlfriend when I have sex with her? And now I'm sorry this may be very confronting to your yeah. listeners today, but the fact is we have a film that's now number one on Netflix called 365 Days, uh. and children are watching this. They're reviewing it. 
they're seeing seeing extracts of that film on TikTok. How do I know that? I watched them this morning. They are being introduced to pornographic themes, themes of extreme violence and subordination and domination of women through TikTok. A lot of parents wouldn't know that. Uh, yes. So what we're seeing is boys especially thinking that this is what sexuality looks like. This is how you treat women. We're desensitising them. And girls think this is normal. This is how I should be treated. I should enjoy this. And if I don't, there's something wrong with me. It's normalising aggression. It endorses rape myths that no really means yes, that girls want to be uh, violated and and assaulted. And the stories that I'm hearing from young people in schools all over the country, which I was hearing pre-COVID, uh, yeah. are evidence that a sexist culture grooms sexist boys and it's yeah. primarily girls that are bearing the brunt of porn porn conditioned boys. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, 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 I'm hoping that there would be a lot of uh, crying eye emojis right now because... Um, I don't think you're going to get very many happy ones, Neil, to be honest with you. <laughs> that's right. And I think the thing yeah. is, um, or angry even, because the reality yeah. is that um, it just, I, I just... We actually you know, need to be angry. We actually should be more angry. Um, this is an experiment yeah. we've never Great. done before. We're seeing rising rates of child-on-child -child sexual abuse, and yeah. sexual assault, including in schools, at rates never before seen. Yeah. We have children being groomed and preyed on, even on Instagram. That's another campaign we've got running at the moment. All the places kids like to be, uh, predators and pornographers and the sex industry is right there. And the yeah. stories are getting more distressing, more heartbreaking uh, every day. We should be angry. That's actually a just response. So would you mind um, unpacking that a little bit? Because, um, you know, I want to know what trends that are you seeing amongst teenagers in school and pornography? Well, I wrote a piece for the ABC called Growing Up in Pornland, Why Girls Have Had It with Porn Conditioned Boys. And in that piece, I documented what young women were telling me around the country uh, for example, a girl in year seven said, if a boy wants to hit me, tie me up and stalk me, does that mean he really loves me? I have young girls say, asking, how do I say no without hurting his feelings? Um, you know, they are being disempowered in a porn culture. They have been turned into porn fantasy props for boys. Girls yeah. tell me of daily sexual intrusion, sexual harassment, groping. They tell me about having their bodies compared to the bodies of porn stars. Younger and younger girls are being pressured to send naked pictures, sexualized yeah. selfies, and, of course, they lose control of these images. They end up online. They can't get them back. Uh, terrible pressures there. Um, uh, they they described constant uh, being constantly hassled for sexual favours even at school. You know, I used to present just to upper secondary. Then I got asked to do middle secondary. Then I got asked to do seven and eights. I'm now being asked to address grades four, fives, and sixes in primary school because of inappropriate sexual behaviours. Because boys are being exposed to porn, they're acting out on girls. And uh, they think this this is normal. Look what we've done to them. What hope will they have of forming intimate, respect based relationships in future? Of being in a you know long term partnerships of of sustaining a, a family life. You know this has ripple on effects uh, in every area of their lives. And the adults have allowed this to happen. Yeah. Our governments have failed us. Our regulatory bodies have failed us. Even when we say, surely we can find common ground here and agree that little kids shouldn't be seeing rape and torture and incest porn, we're told that that is some just terrible um, violation of so-called, you know, freedom of speech and, and, and civil liberties. Well, surely we should recognise what the global research says here uh, about the harms to... Our, our children.
Yeah, I mean, I have actually heard that in a particular topic, as a, a particular country, mm. that they're trying to legalize pedophilia, and um, and 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 you know, as an organization, a harm prevention charity, that mm. is horrifying that 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 somehow they think that that's actually something that's okay i wanted to um i wanted to share something with you that um i was speaking with a parent and uh and they actually shared to me that you know they were going to they were sharing me about another family that that their child um they were going out to dinner mm. and uh and the child said no no i'm i'm not feeling well i um I just want to stay home. And uh, what they actually found was yeah. that he stayed home because he wanted to look at pornography. So he yeah. actually wanted to avoid the family dinner, That's not right. because of, not because of dad jokes, but actually mm -hmm. because he wanted to stay home and um, and look at pornography. That is yes. a problem. So what, what we're seeing is uh, more uh, young people being, becoming compulsive consumers and I've interviewed young men about this and they'll say things like I realized that I was lying to my family I realized that I would make excuses not to join them for dinner not to have a family outing because it would take me away from the screen it would take me away from porn they cut themselves off from friends they stop playing sport they stop engaging in life affirming activities that would have in the past given them joy and and meaning and helped them to flourish as young people so what we're seeing is the sexual stunting of a generation compulsive habits which make them more more lonely, more disconnected uh, from family, from from community. Um, I've had young men tell me that they don't even respond to real uh, girls now. They'll say to me, "We are aroused by the mere sight of a screen. You know, this inanimate plastic object arouses them, but not real touch, yeah. real connection." Yeah. You know, they're, they're losing uh, the ability to read body language, to read face-to-face -face contact because they're so aroused by screens and, th and that's, what, that's what interests them. It's an absolute tragedy, the destruction of, of boys' lives, uh, the destruction of, of their ability to have um, healthy friendships, let alone, you know, intimate relationships um, because it steals them away from meaningful activities uh, which would act as protection against depression and anxiety. Um, you know, all the mental health problems besieging our young young people, including our our young men. So that story that you've told, I, I hear this, you know, all, all the time. Mm. So um, I don't know if you've been seeing this over in New Zealand, but they have been um, they've been showing some pretty incredible videos uh actually i found out that they're actually using porn stars in them um but uh have you seen those videos where they, oh, they come to the door and say, oh hi i'm on this or whatever it is you know um, fact, if your uh, viewers today uh were to check out our collective shout website hopefully later today when i do the final edit uh, we have done an analysis of those videos, and okay. uh, we like a, lo a lot of. We like the aim, we like the intention, we like the fact that the New Zealand government uh, is really taking solid steps to to educate the harms of porn. We do have a, a few problems uh, with a couple of them, and uh, you mentioned there that the porn stars, um, the actors there, are. They look very happy, and the woman looks, you know, just the glowing and the epitome of, of robust yeah. good health, which isn't really, you know, no. reality. And also the onus is all on the parents, not the industry that yeah. is destroying our, our children. Uh, the onus is, is always on the parents. And I noticed there was only a mother in the, two, yeah. the one about porn and the one about online predators. Hello, yeah. Dad, why yeah. isn't there a father in this picture? Why yeah. is it up? to have those difficult conversations so uh we we've we've welcomed those uh, that campaign uh, but we have a few reservations yeah well 
You've mentioned parents, parents, parents. It's it's their responsibility. Uh, we're going to get to this really important question now, um, and that is how do parents broach the subject and talking about pornography with their children and yeah. why do some parents avoid it? Okay. So the first thing I want to say about parents is this is not a fair fight. You know, parents are up against a multi-billion dollar industry which is preying on our children. So I just want to sort of preface what I'm about to say with uh, it takes a village to raise a child and yes. there's too much responsibility being put on parents. It's too hard for us. I have I have four kids. Uh, I I see how difficult, you know, this this is. Uh, where parents are exhausted trying to manage kids' behaviour online, exhausted trying to understand the technology. Of course, our kids are running rings around us. So I'm not here to sort of beat up on parents. There's enough of that going on. We carry enough guilt already. That's uh, right. Yeah, that's not what we're here for. How yeah. inadequate we are. So I just want to say that. Now, having said that, we have no choice but to have this conversation with our children because if we're not having that conversation, someone else is. Yeah. And uh, this is an industry that does not care at all about our children, not not one bit. Uh, it's quite happy uh, not, not only to drop porn into their, their feeds, uh, it's also happy to, to, to make porn out of the bodies of children and we've exposed this with our global campaign against Pornhub. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We've got over a million signatures now on a petition as part of a global uh, campaign calling out Pornhub. So we have to have the conversation. And the first thing is that we need to show our children that they can trust us with sensitive and difficult subjects, that we love them and care for them enough to have this conversation, that they can come to us if they're being pressured, um, if they've seen something inappropriate online. They can trust us. Uh, we can talk to them about what uh, healthy sexuality should look like, what uh, what consent should look like, what intimate relationships. We can certainly model that at home because it's not always as parents what we say, is it? It's, it's what we do. Okay. Um, we can help them to understand that uh, they will see inappropriate content. Now, it may not be in the family home. It might be on a, a kid's phone at school. It might be on the school bus on the way home from school. I'm being told that kids are gathering at school at recess and lunchtime and they are watching this film I mentioned, 365 Days, at mm. school. So it's not always what happens at home, is it? No. We have to have the conversation. We uh, need to explain to them that uh, there are things that are inappropriate that they will see. If they see it, they need to tell uh, mum or dad or a trusted adult straight away. If it's happened at school, that becomes a duty of care issue for the school and the school needs to be told uh, about this and the school needs to uh, take action uh, yeah. as well. Uh, if you notice that your child is enjoying in family activities, that they seem to be secretive, it feels like they might be keeping something uh, from you, that's often uh, a warning sign, uh, changes in sleep patterns, changes um, in um, eating, those kind of things can be uh, warning signs. Of course, have data every... Data use. Sorry? Data yeah. use. Right. The data use. Um, check that they may, have, they may have a second phone. Uh, you know, a lot of kids tell me, uh, you know, mum mum makes his hand in our phone at night, but they've got a second phone or they've got another SIM card. Like they, they're clever little buggers, let's face yeah, it. Sneaky. Right? <laughs> sneaky, yeah. Give them an A+. Plus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a really bad joke. But, um, you know, they need to know that uh, the harms to them, the risks to them uh, of, what, of what they will be exposed to online. Now, what to do if your child's seen porn, uh, which will happen. Yeah. Try to stay calm. Take a deep breath. Try not to panic. If you have a massive meltdown, a massive breakdown in front of the kid, they're not going to tell you the second time. No. So we have to somehow try to stay calm and then, talk it through, find out where they saw it uh, so that you can try to protect them from seeing it again. If you if you don't have uh, internet filtering uh, software yet, uh, I can recommend uh, Family Zone, which all my IT friends uh, tell me is uh, the best one out there. Yeah. If you believe the use has become compulsive, uh, the child may need psychological help. Uh, I've talked to parents who say that their child was exposed to porn by an older child and those children are now uh, medicated, they suffer insomnia and nightmares. When it gets to that stage, obviously there needs to be some kind of 
a professional intervention. Uh, mm. There's a lot of good resources now. E-Safety Commission has uh, resources available to help. Those books that I mentioned, um, Collective Shout, we have resources on our pages as well uh, to help you have this difficult conversation. Yeah, and, you know, the thing is... Um what I did with uh, my children is, um, you know, a couple of them at that age where we're talking about sex um, and the different body parts and those sort of things. Um, and one thing that I did is, is I actually coupled the sex talk with pornography. And so we talked about respecting women and, and um, et cetera. And, and I found that they received that rather than better in that space because it was connected to the, larger uh, conversation mm -hmm. rather than sitting down and go, hey, let's talk about porn. Like I that's think that's, that's, that's the cool. wrong approach. And I yeah. think actually what you said is um, is capitalising on the moments. So, for instance, that's if right. you do walk past Honey Birdette, you might turn to them and say, do you think that's okay? They say, right. oh, yeah, 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 I'm, I, I see that stuff. What? You see that stuff? Can we – let's have a conversation, sit down and yes. um, have, a, have a hot chocolate together and have a conversation. That's I think right. – what as age, moments. Yeah, what age do you think it would be wise for parents to have that conversation with them? Yeah, I often get asked this question and I wish I could say an older age than it needs to be. Now, obviously, with, with younger children, you, you, you start in a way that you teach them to use proper names for body parts yep. because if something happens to them, they can describe it. Uh, you teach them about uh, what's appropriate touch and what isn't. You teach them that their body is theirs and they're allowed to say, no, I don't want to hug uncle whoever. Or I don't want to wrestle with cousin whoever. You, you, you help them to know that they don't have to do something that they don't want to do. So you, you introduce the conversation in an age-appropriate way. Yeah. Uh, Sadly, we are having to talk to children in grades fives and sixes about sexting because it's happening that young. It's oh, yeah. hard to believe, isn't it? It's we, hard to believe, yeah. We have discovered on Instagram uh, nine-year-olds uh, being preyed on by predators. We've exposed the accounts of, of hundreds of predators that are, are targeting underage girls online and uh, during live chats, a girl is doing a live chat, anyone can join that chat. And she doesn't know who that person is yeah. until yeah. you're on the chat. And we have found men literally live masturbating to underage girls on Instagram. Now, I'm, I'm saying this because a lot of parents think that Instagram is relatively harmless, that it's just a whole bunch of photo sharing. There's much yeah. more to it uh, than, than that. And that, that's just the horrible, uh, the horrible reality there. Uh, so age appropriate, but sooner than sooner than later, if you want to protect your child from inevitable exposure, I have parents telling me uh, my child uh, just searched an innocent search term into a search engine, and porn pictures came up. They might yeah. be looking for something in Google Images, uh, an innocent term, uh, a favorite animal. Doesn't matter what it is. There's nothing that the porn industry won't turn into porn. Yeah. So there's really no safe space online. And if you have given your child an internet-able device, you've given them a hand grenade that will blow up. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. You know, that sounds dramatic, but, you know, I've been doing this work for a while now. Yeah. And uh, it's not going to go well. It's really not going to go well. Um, even just yesterday I had a parent contact me uh, discovering that their their 13-year-old had been... Uh, threatened and uh, bribed uh, to send images. And, you know, the horrible discovery for the parent to know to know this. And these are the stories that I am told uh, frequently. So, yeah, have the conversation and you have to start young, tragically. You know, um, I have heard of uh, uh, people who are my age mm. and younger and, mm. um, and they became addicted to pornography because they wanted to know about sex and their parents wouldn't talk to them about it because they thought that it was dirty to talk about it, it was a taboo subject. Yeah. So where do you find about find out about sex? You go and search for it. And yeah. through that process, they became addicted to pornography. Now this is these these are young women. Mm -hmm. um, these are young adult women mm -hmm. um, who you would have thought that maybe there's an opportunity to be able to understand that. 
Um, yeah. But the truth, the truth is that um, what I hear you saying is mm. as parents, and we need to let them know this, is please yeah. don't avoid this subject. Correct. Uh, young people are looking to uh, porn as a sex education handbook, but it is a poor sex educator. It gives a hollow understanding of true intimacy, of real sensuality, of connection, and dare I say, love. Right? Yeah. They're not going to learn about love from pornography. It's not possible. The most no. popular genres of porn are the most violent, right? They're going to learn about violence. And uh, they, they're, they're just being set up for f failure. You know, reviewing all my, my notes again for our talk today, Neil, it's just made me even angrier than I often am. But, you know, <laughs> we've got to recognise what we are doing to our our young people, to their lives. You know, it's it's absolutely, absolutely criminal what we've allowed to happen. And that's why we do have to help them to understand that there's an, a completely different version of sexuality um, which is healthy, which is positive, which is wonderful, you know, that they're not going to get yeah. online through the global porn industry. Yeah, that's right. So there's been a, um, we're going to take questions in just one moment, but um, there has been one that does connect in mm -hmm. that um, how do we actually speak to kids that are younger than grade five so mm -hmm. younger than grade five I'm, I'm i'm thinking that you're going to say that it's actually about body safety and and um talking about the right names for your body parts but also um respectful relationships and those sort of things is that right yeah that's correct uh, yes yeah, what what i said earlier um what what's good touch what's not safe touch open communications not making them do things that they don't want to do in terms of expressing affection to someone or allowing someone else to express affection to them if they don't if they don't want that. Being very careful about screens, uh, what older children might be introducing to them, yeah, what they may be seeing at school. Find out what your school's uh, policy is around yeah. devices. Some schools, fortunately, have banned devices from school. Uh, not yeah. just because of the risks, the things we've already talked about, because the kids can't focus. They yeah. can't concentrate. They can't learn anything. Yeah. Uh, they can't read a book because it's they're so hyper-stimulated by the flashing lights and all the images and the scrolling that's, you know, hitting them in the head and they can't um, learn. They can't do serious learning. So, again, find out what your school uh, policy uh, is and if they don't have one, uh, make sure make sure they get one or think about another another school yeah absolutely well um these the last question for i guess the pre-planned ones that we chatted about mm. um is what does a parent do if they have a child who is addicted to pornography mm. and how can you tell you said a couple of a couple mm. of things but i think there's a little bit more that can be unpacked yeah. um and then we'll get to our Q&A. And I just want to say a massive thank you to all those that are sharing their stories, their comments and their frustrations through the live feed, both on YouTube and on Facebook. And um, we really appreciate that. And thank you for being so vulnerable and real with a tough topic. So mm -hmm. over to you. So, again, uh, remaining calm when you find out because it is a shock for any parent to discover this. It really is a shock. Yeah, it is. Um, trying not to, to panic. Now, if the use has become compulsive, this is very, very serious and, and will likely need professional help. Now, young men that I've spoken to who have uh, been able to stop consuming porn uh, told me that they had to take radical action. Wow. They limit how much time they're on the computer. Some actually get rid of their computer or their devices altogether or they hand it to third parties. and only take it back like if they really need to do an assignment or something like that. Um, the child may need professional help from someone who actually knows what they're doing because, unfortunately, uh, there are, this is anecdotally what I'm told, uh, too uh, many people in the so-called counselling professions who think that porn can be helpful, that it can be good, that it can be used uh, to educate about 
about sexuality. And that's certainly not, not my position after more than a decade of, of research and writing a book on the subject. Uh, so, look, it, it needs professional intervention. Uh, ask around, get recommendations. Uh, for the right person to help your child um, through this because it, it, it won't be a simple way back. It's not a simple way back. Uh, it'll need a lot of help and a lot of intervention and a lot of family support and some pretty strict boundaries as well to try to, uh, yeah, to, get, to get your child uh, back on track to have a, a, you know, a good life because porn isn't going to give them a good life. No, and that's the thing is that, um, you know, we talked about rewiring the brain, but actually even further than that, mm. you, you're not just rewiring the brain, you're setting, a, setting them up for failure of relationships. Pornography sets them up for failure of relationships, failure of friendships, um, mm. failure of work, you know, people missing work to look at pornography, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. And then when they won't be able to Yep. And they won't be able to get aroused. Um, they won't be able to get aroused naturally um, when uh, a, a woman or a man enters. You know, it's it's totally. Uh, um, and and the truth is that it is. You're right. It is incredibly tough mm -hmm. for people to get off of um, the addiction. We're yeah. going to um, take questions now, and while mm -hmm. that's happening, and we're getting them fed through to us, um, mm -hmm. we. Uh, we wanted to also say don't forget to like and share and comment and tag your friends um, so that uh, you can win these books um, for you um, and uh, that would be really, really good. So um, our first question. You can always order them from my, my website. I'm, I'm, there's a special on there at the moment. So. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you won't miss out if you do that. But we do want you to like because we want to get this as far as we can. We had yeah. so many people register. There's so many people online. We just um, want to get this as wide as we can because it's so mm -hmm. important. So the first question today is, um, are there any common, uh, come on, I can't read that, to porn addiction? To put, oh, sorry. There, are there any common um, traits to porn addicted children? So. Uh, making excuses for not being with, with the family. They, see, they cease engagement in their usual activities. They might not want to play sport anymore. They not want to, may not want to go out and hang out with their friends. Their school grades may start to suffer. Their sleep may be interrupted. Uh, they may lose their appetite. It's, you're really looking for secrecy, excuses, just wanting to be in their room the whole time with the door closed. Yeah. A sudden, say the parent suddenly enters a room and there's a sudden um, closing of the laptop lid or a sudden jerking away, hiding the phone, putting the phone somewhere else, trying to keep the screen away from the parent. Those kind of signs are what you should look for and then try to introduce the conversation. They may not be very happy about that. They may not be happy that their habit has been discovered, but you, you have to intervene because the, the child will end up in a worse place. And, I again, I've done a lot of interviews with uh, individuals who have been porn consumers and they've said they never expected to end up in the kind of places they ended up in, consuming illegal content, uh, often child sexual exploitation material and um, other content of that nature, not expecting that's where they'd end up. But because they become desensitised to what they started out with, they end up needing more hard content. Uh, something else that's that's worked a little bit with uh, boys that I've spoken to, young men that I've spoken to, is that I'll say to them, you have no idea uh, of the truth of that the woman's life whose body you are consuming. And uh, from research we know that uh, many women who end up in the sex industry uh, are women who have come from marginalised back backgrounds, uh, perhaps child abuse growing up, and um, some may have been trafficked, and we have exposed this with Pornhub, uh, yeah. that yeah. videos have been created from women who have been trafficked into that industry. And so I've said to men, if you're consuming porn, you've become a patron of a global industry which trades in the bodies 
of of women like is that really what you do you want to be that person and I've had boys say to me that when they they heard that they still had enough of an ethical center and ethical a conscience to realize I don't want to be a patron of that global industry and it's helped them not just to think of how it's hurting them but how they're contributing to uh, a, a global harm, a global human rights violations. I don't even remember what the question was, but it was very good. Thank you. No, no. So, I'm probably getting a bit carried away here. No, no, that's fine. I, I love that you're passionate about this topic, and you should be. You should be as a parent, but also as a human. We should all be um, raising the child, you know, as a community. Well, we just um, can't afford to leave the, the sexual formation of our children in the hands of this uh, unethical global sex industry. We just cannot allow that to happen. That's right. So um, has there been any, have you done any research around um, any common uh, conditions like ADHD or anxiety or anything that sort of has spawned from addiction to pornography? Uh, Certainly uh, mental health uh, impacts, uh, certainly impacts on uh, sleep, depression, Alcohol consumption, uh, often these things are, you know, interconnected. Uh, low self-esteem, um, self-hatred, feeling that you can't get get free of this. Like some studies I've looked at, uh, some young men are consuming porn every spare hour they have. Some are even using it in the workplace and barely doing any work. Yeah, we're talking like hours and hours a day for years, you know, for yeah. years and years and years. So again, you're not going to flourish uh, as a as a human being uh, when you're engaging like that. Uh, one young man said to me, it changed the way that he viewed women. He said previously he could be friends with women, he could have good relationships, he enjoyed uh, the company of women. But he said when he became a compulsive porn user, he said every woman he started to see only in sexual terms. He said, I would undress them in my mind. Yeah. And he resented that idea. He resented those thoughts but but couldn't get free of them and realised that he'd started to see every, every female as an object for his pleasure and gratification mm. uh, rather than as a, as a whole person of dignity and worth and worthy of, of respect. Yeah. Well, one last question I want to ask you is... Um, that's come through is what does a erectile dysfunction if I could just sort of throw that in there yes, anyway, yes. erectile dysfunction in teenage boys this has not happened in history no. uh, and we need to appeal to boys as you know for a selfish reason uh, as well as the ethical reasons of you know becoming a patron of a global industry you start telling them the research about uh, not being able to get an erection and that can sometimes yeah. Cause them to consider it in a whole whole new way, but yeah, teenage boys are being treated for erectile dysfunction problems, which in the past was a disease of old age. Yeah, and also obviously um, we don't need to go into this, but we know that GPs are now seeing uh, injuries from um, sex acts from from young children, as in you know 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds who are watching porn and acting it out with their partner um, and. Are, are even causing um, life-altering body uh, yeah. problems um, yeah. within GP. So uh, the last question I want to ask before we kind of wrap it up is um, yeah. is obviously right now we have mums and dads listening and I, I hope there's no kids and I'm sure there's not, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, mums and dads are listening. The reality is that whilst we want the family unit to be united in this subject truth is that there might be some people listening right now or will listen later that are a mum or a dad and they actually have different views um for instance the the husband might have different views or the partner might have different views and says oh there's nothing wrong with it and does it himself and etc and the wife and vice versa we know that that's the same what do they do in that situation in trying to teach their children what is right? I think this is one of the hardest questions that I'm asked at parent events around the country because if the parents are not united, it's it's an extreme and unjust responsibility 
for, and I'm going to say the mother because it's usually the mother. Now, I have spoken to mothers whose uh, partners consume porn at home and sometimes in front of the children. Now, to me, that's get out of there, run for your life or get yeah. him to leave preferably because, you know, why, does the, why do the woman and children have to leave? That's, right. yeah. that's an act of child abuse right there. Like it's yeah, actually it crime it to expose children to So let's name it. Uh, that's yeah. actually child abuse and you have every right to protect your child from child abuse. If the father is justifying his own porn consumption, if he is introducing porn to boys, which is tragically not uh, an uncommon thing from anecdotally from what I hear, uh, you have a right to protect yourself and your children from the harms of pornography in the home. And if he isn't willing to consider the research, consider his own children, if he's putting his own porn consumption before the well-being of the family unit, he doesn't deserve to have the family, I'm sorry, you know, because he obviously doesn't care enough uh, for his own children and his own partner to actually do something about that. Uh, look, I don't have an easy answer on this one. I do, I do find this one very difficult and very complex, but yes. I've spoken to women who for years tried to keep the family unit together uh, but he, you know, the, the the other the other parent is not willing to to change, um, to make concessions, to accept that pornography is dangerous and harmful and toxic for all the reasons I've already described. Uh, then there needs to be some serious serious response. And I'd like to think that uh, the aggrieved partner uh, and the children would have a a community around her that could uh, help her to exit that situation. Yeah. I've got folders of stories like this, collections of accounts, and some women have tried to make it work and others have decided we can't do this. This is part of the continuum of domestic violence, which, you know, we need to acknowledge that uh, porn is also a tool of violence. A it tool is. Of domestic violence, of violence against women and children, and we need to acknowledge that. Absolutely, and and that's that's a really good end note for us in terms of our interview and our question time because you're right. Um, the truth is there is nothing good that can come from pornography. There is Correct. nothing good that can come from pornography, but there is everything good that can come from a discussion about pornography. That's right. And that's what we want to leave with you guys um, as parents. That, that this is such an important topic and that's why at Child Safe Australia we're not afraid to broach tough topics because we want to help you as parents to be the best parents that you can be uh, and because the team at Child Safe are parents as well and we know how important this is mm -hmm. and uh, we know that these discussions are not being had because the pornographic industry is thriving. It is one of the largest money-making industries in the world mm -hmm. alongside child sex trafficking. And, um, and arms dealership. So that is really, really important to understand. Melinda, there is so much thanks for mm -hmm. you uh, mm -hmm. coming in. There is massive, massive amounts of um, thanks and especially for having you on and, and uh, people sharing their stories. What you're doing is you're giving people the place and the platform to be able to um, just, just, just be able to share where they're at. And I think that's what you're doing well. I want to commend you on your 10 years with Collective Shouts. Thank you. Um, Thank you. There have been other questions have mm. come to us. So can I ask, Melinda, if you can, um, after this, go through on the Child Save Australia page and answer those questions yourself? Yes, um, I can do that. Or if you yeah. like, you can contact us as well uh, yeah. through collectiveshout.org and we're happy to have an ongoing conversation uh, on this subject. And thank you, Neil, for making this possible. Not everyone wants to go to these difficult and dark places, <laughs> but if we care about our kids, uh, we have no choice but to have this conversation. So thanks to you and your team for making it happen. That's no worries. Well, we'll say goodbye to you, and uh, I'm just going to wrap this up now. So thank you so much, Melinda, and um, we really appreciate you and everything you stand for. Thank you so much again and thanks to everyone who took part today. No worries. Thanks.
Uh, so I hope you uh, were, were encouraged by that discussion and also, um, I guess, impacted incredibly hard. And we'd love to hear from you about how this has impacted you. Um, as we said, if you go into the draw, you can go into the draw to win those two books, um, How to Talk to Your Children About Pornography and, uh, and the other one around images. Um, it's what's really important is um, is you go to childsafe.org.au forward slash live and you can find out more information. Also have the link to uh, this will be available on our YouTube channel but also on um, on the Facebook, uh, Child Safe Australia Facebook page. Um, but just go to the Child Safe Live one, you'll be able to get to it. The other thing I wanted to let you know is, as I said at the start, that um, Child Safe Australia dash for parents. So it's a specific Facebook page for parents that we've got. And we're going to put up different uh, information, different opportunities, different ways in which you can connect. Um, so please come and um, be part of that group. The other thing is, is as I said at the start, that these, um, these conversations are happening every month. And next month on July 22nd, um, at 3.30, we've got Dr. Jodie Richardson. Um, she's going to be talking about how to parent anxious kids. Not how to parent kids with anxiety, but how to, um, how to parent anxious kids. And in this time of COVID, it has been an incredibly crazy time. Um, the other thing is that um, the replay of this will also be uh, available and all of ours is available on our Child Safe Australia Facebook page. I want to thank you so much for being here. If you want to see these happen um, more regularly, we want to invite you to uh, to go on to this website, childsafe.org.au forward slash live, and you can even make a donation, which a lot of people ask they can do. So I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thanks for talking about this with us, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Take care.